Okay, good morning everyone. Allow me to once again say um, what a privilege it is for me to be able to have been here, to have been invited and to be able to participate um, in the last few days and to now be granted the privilege of being able to share with you about something that I believe is um, very important, I'm sure in many of your experiences um, in theological education, um, so whether you come from the, the developed world <clears throat> or you have been involved in theological education within the developing world, especially in Africa, we know that the um, issue of accreditation is, is a huge one. In fact, if you were to probably do some kind of survey amongst those who have been involved in theological education, especially in Africa for a number of years, and you were to ask them, you know, what are the, what are the, what are the key things, what are the, the big challenges that you are facing, then accreditation would probably either be the number one issue, you know, depending upon what's happening in your neck of the woods, um, or it would probably be amongst the top three. Um, and so, so it is something that is very important. You know, it has been said by someone that Africa is on a great paper chase. Paper that would hopefully give one a sense of worth, give one a sense of importance. And so as a result, there seems to be this chase after certificates that could adorn our walls and make it look like Christmas throughout the year. Um, because sometimes those certificates do sometimes for the individual provide a sense of value, some sense of worth. Um, I think one of the best quotes um, I heard on that um, came earlier this year when we had a visiting speaker that some of you might know in the person of Dr. James Merritt who joined us and some of our seminary students and local pastors um, in, in a preaching conference. And he put it this way, he said, there are so many doctors in the church, you would think God is sick. <laughs> but nevertheless, it does not mean that these certificates aren't important. Um, and so while the certificate might give the individual, you know, through a qualification that they have achieved, um, some sense of personal worth, um, it also, I believe, adds value to what we do as institutions in education. So certificates are often certificates of qualification. And I'm sure um, on many occasions you have looked at or you have had students coming to visit you in your office to admire the certificates on your wall. When my students ask me, so where are your certificates? I say they're in my drawer. Because I want to make a different point. Um, so I've got nothing against certificates adorning the wall because I believe the certificates communicate a message, but sometimes you look at them and you admire them. These beautifully, the, the, these beautifully um, decorated certificates embossed in gold, sometimes silver, jasper, sapphire, chalcedony, topaz, your own visa to heaven. But sometimes in Africa, these certificates that some people claim to have and that they so um, freely and easily display is often not worth the very paper it is written on. The same is true for accreditation. So the chase for, for paper in Africa is not just around qualifications, you know, where, where people like to have um, some letters in front of their name and after their name. Um, and the certificates to, to prove that. Um, but sometimes, you know, to be part of an institution that can also demonstrate some form of accreditation. And Africa, over the last number of generations, has been flooded by all kinds of institutions, often claiming to offer much, but actually worth very little. And for that reason, accreditation is very important. Because I believe... And, and that's been the, 
the, the word that we are using in conjunction with the word accreditation, it provides a sense of accountability. You know, that is a very, very important virtue, if I might term it that, an important value um, that, we, that we seek to embody within who we are as Christian educators, as ministers of the gospel. Um, we not only seek to preach the truth, to believe the truth, but to pass on the truth. And so the word accountability within accreditation is, is very important. Now I do recognize today that in a group such as this, we are at probably different stages within this process of accreditation. I know that for some of you, you have been in this game, if I might term it that, of accreditation for many years, especially if you come from the, come, come from the developed world. But within Africa, the, the situation kind of varies and often varies quite, quite drastically and dramatically. And so I do recognize that, that some of you are sorted, if you want to, term, if you want to use that word. Um, you've been able to achieve accreditation through, through various means. But, but for some of you, um, it is quite a frustration. It is quite a challenge um, and something that is deeply frustrating. Now, I do not claim to be an expert in accreditation. Um, my experience more in accreditation has come about because when I got involved at the Cape Town Baptist Seminary, it just so happened to be in the year that a very, very important act was passed in Parliament called the Higher Education Act of 1997. And that act, unbeknownst to us, dramatically overnight, dramatically changed the landscape and sought to change the landscape of education in South Africa. And so I came into the seminary, um, especially in 1998, as registrar, um, having accepted a job description and then immediately discovered that there was something that was not on my job description, but that would take 90% of my time. And that thing was called accreditation. Because I can remember sitting behind my desk doing my registrar things, you know, you might call it the administrative or the, or the academic dean in some of, your, some of your settings, and some of my colleagues visiting and coming down the, the hallway and saying, hey, what are you guys doing about what was in the newspaper last week? And I said to him, what was in the newspaper? And I happened to read the newspaper. He says, you know, about this accreditation thing. And I says, no, but that does not apply to us. He says, well, then maybe we need to check again. And when I checked again, uh, the journey started for me, you know, because I can remember going to the then um, principal, as we call it, or president of the seminary and saying to have you seen this? You know, I immediately called what was, what was then the body that was set up in South Africa to, to perform the task of accreditation, the South African Qualifications Authority, they are still somewhat of a role player within this process in South Africa, but, but take on a very different role. And then being told, oh yes, you know, you are required to do it. We will send you a book that will tell you what you need to do. And I asked them, and so how long will this process take? And they said to me, well, the due date is the end of March. And we were probably in the middle of February. <laughs> so so when, this, when this book came, it really became for me a nightmare, you know, which for many people in Africa, <laughs> that is what the accreditation experience often feels like. This monstrous exercise, it's alive. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and, and here I was, like you are, with a deep desire to serve the Lord, to do your best, so that seminary could become, you know, the greatest show, you know. Uh, I know, please don't be offended by that. You know, my daughters love this movie. <laughs> and hardly a night passes by, you know, whether this music doesn't, you know, uh, play, play through, my, uh, through, through, through my house. You know, but, but it's not that we, that, 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 that seminary education is not serious. It's very, very serious. But, but we, we are seeking and we are aiming through what we are doing, to do something that we believe is of quality. Something that we believe is of worth. Something 
that is an expression of the great trust that has been placed with us, that trust of the gospel, of training men and women who the Lord has placed their hands upon to serve Him in different spheres and forms of ministry, and we want to give our best. And so we believe, and this is what the history of theological education is all about, that it is through the process of accreditation that this is normally accomplished. Now let me say this. If your institution is not accredited, that does not mean that you are doing a bad job, necessarily. You know, so I'm not wanting to suggest that. Um, because, you know, sometimes there are other factors at play. You know, because sometimes the issue of accreditation, you know, can become something that, 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 that makes us very boastful or that think, that think that we are better than other institutions. But at the end of the day, that when we do embrace or we are forced to embrace the whole process of accreditation, um, it will actually help us to accomplish that goal of offering quality theological education. Now, there are different variations of what accreditation means, and, and I'm going to be mostly speaking from a South African experience, but also being somewhat familiar of what generally happens in Africa via ACTI. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm quite familiar um, with, with what ACTI does, and I'm wanting to say I endorse what ACTI does. And, and I do believe that as we take a look at shared solutions um, in accreditation within Africa, that that's probably going to provide for, for many of you in your situations your best possible opportunity for offering an accredited qualification. Now, the South African definition of accreditation, and I've actually tweaked it a little bit, you know, because I'm familiar with the system, and I'm aware that there's actually more to the process than what they actually say. But, you know, we basically define it as a recognition status granted to a program. In our context, it's actually also to an institution. So accreditation is never just for a program. It's also an accreditation of the institution for a stipulated period of time after an evaluation indicates that it meets minimum standards of quality based upon stipulated criteria. Now... Depending on where you are in Africa, and the same is true for us in South Africa, we actually do not just talk about accreditation. We actually speak about and have to speak about registration because that is the bigger responsibility in our setting. So, so to state it basically as follows, in South Africa, if you are an accredited institution, that does not automatically mean that you can operate. You actually have to be registered, which is a separate yet parallel and connected process. So we have an accrediting authority in South Africa established by an act of parliament independent from the, the Department of Higher Education and Training in South Africa. Um, it's called the Higher Education Quality Committee. They are often just known by the acronym CHE, the Council on Higher Education, and they are responsible for accrediting all programs in South Africa, including theological education. Now let me also say this, in South Africa, for example, it is not possible for anybody to be involved in formal education without being accredited and registered. It is illegal. You will get into trouble and they will close you down. You know, so, so, so we operate in South Africa within a very difficult and, a, and in a very tight, um, tightly legislated um, area. But besides the accreditation, you know, which is a huge part of the process, we also have to go through what is called registration with the Department of Higher Education and Training. And, and the reason why I want to mention this as well is because often accreditation becomes this buzzword. You know, have you been accredited? You know, um, people say yes, you know, but Sometimes accreditation doesn't mean the same thing depending on where, where you are coming from. So I'm not wanting to spend a lot of time on that, but to talk about some of the processes um, that is involved in this. Now, my experience has also informed me and taught me that there are often objections to accreditation. While many people are seeking accreditation, and many institutions like some here have actually embraced accreditation, there are, however, some objections. And I just want to mention, um, not necessarily try and answer all of them, 
You know, because sometimes these things do go through your mind. You know, besides the little angel that appears on your left shoulder that says to you a credit, there's this other one that sometimes appears on the right shoulder and says, no, don't do it. You know, and here are some of those objections. It is not biblical. Now, what verse in the Bible? Maybe in the Message Bible, <laughs> with respect to Eugene Peterson. <laughs> you know, but, it's, but, but you know, as Baptists, we say, you know, we are people of the book and something is not biblical. But, but you know, often there are principles in the Bible, you know, as Ray said to us the other day, that, that we also need to take cognizance of, that does set the agenda for us. So yes, in a sense, it's not biblical, but you know, um, I, I do believe I'm going, to be, I'm going to be attempting to answer it also on some of that basis, you know. Some people say it's just a money-making scheme, you know, because sometimes accreditation and accreditation processes and some of the related processes can be very expensive. And that is true within the South African situation. You know, when you take a look at the, 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 the basic costs, you know, of the accreditation process, it doesn't actually look that demanding. But the minute you start getting into it, you begin to realize that there's more to this than what meets the eye. You know, because there are some requirements that you have to meet in, in which you need to get other service providers in who themselves are accredited or credible to be able to do that for you, like um, auditors, <laughs> you know, and that, and it's going to cost you quite a bit of money. Um, in South Africa, we also have to do, and, 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 and this is what, what happens in every situation of accreditation I'm aware of, you have to do a site visit or a site evaluation. And in our situation, that is the most expensive part of the exercise because you have to pay all the costs, the related costs of the accrediting group that's coming to visit you the airfares and the stipends and everything else. So it's, it sometimes feels as if it's just a money-making scheme. Some people feel it's a waste of valuable time and resources. You know, all the money that we are spending on accreditation and all the related issues, you know, we could have been spending on library books, you know, or valuable multimedia resources, you know, or employing um, additional faculty or paying our faculty more. Um, and now we have to spend it on like, like we've had to do, you know, you have to spend it on other processes and even employ people eventually who will just do this work because it has become so much. And then there's the issue, especially for us as Baptists, separation of church and state. Now, now this is something that we have to watch very carefully because I'm not wanting to deny that sometimes within the accreditation processes, there could be areas in which as Baptists, we could experience this challenge. Um, now, in our South African experience, that has not been the case up until the last accreditation cycle. You know, because up until that time, the government wasn't really bothered as to what the actual content is. You know, it's, it can be as Baptist and as evangelical and as conservative as you want it to be. You know. However, in the last accreditation cycle, we, we started becoming worried because there were certain areas in which they started asking questions, in which we started feeling maybe that pressure um, is, is growing, you know. And, and I know, having chatted to some colleagues in Australia, that this is exactly what they're experiencing. You know, the government is starting to take a look at the content of what they are teaching. In fact, the government is even recently starting to legislate the content taught in home schools. Issue of separate... Interference in our curriculum, um, I think I've addressed that as part of the issue of separation of church and state. Or that we will become ivory tower academic institutions with little regard for the church. You know, because sometimes that, that is what accreditation seems to, to, to create. This idea that we are now becoming this um, university or university-like institution you know, and, and so therefore the costs increase, um, and it's all about the prestige, and sometimes, and that can happen, accreditation causes that our moorings, which should be very strongly as seminaries within the church, that those come under strain, and sometimes they, they can break. I've seen this happen in South Africa. 
and sometimes you do just become a ivory tower institution. But those are some of the objections that I'm aware of. But, but is there maybe, you know, while there is no specific biblical verse for accreditation, is there, is there maybe some principles that we can learn? So, so, so yes, I, I want to agree there's no verse speaking about accreditation, but maybe there is a verse that talks about its effects. They will throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, which for those of you who are Greek scholars will know that that word, that noun there, blazing furnace, very interesting word, actually comes from a verb called administrazo, that means to be completely immersed in paperwork. Because that's the experience. Because when you start, you go down into the paperwork, you get completely immersed in it, and then you rise up out of the paperwork. No, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm actually just kidding. Um, there, there is no such word in Greek <laughs> that I'm aware of. But, but I do think that one can make, especially for us as Baptists, you know, because we say that everything we do has to have its foundation um, in, in Scripture. And, and I had to go through this exercise. You know, because I can remember, you know, when we had to start the accreditation process and the then principal had to go and speak to the board of directors, they all looked at him with blank stares. And then he said to them, he's going to call me in and I have to share the news with them. And I had to provide them with a motivation, you know, besides saying to them, we are legally required to do so. But, you know, sometimes you have to soften some people. And so what I've tended to do is to argue that if we are going to be good custodians of the trust that has been given to us in theological education, then we could argue a biblical basis from within a biblical theology of stewardship, you know, the, the, the broad aspects of stewardship, not just about money, you know, because that's, that's what a lot of people think when we speak about stewardship. It's about your tithe. There's more to stewardship than just that, as well as the Protestant work ethic in which there are, I think, principles that comes out of certain verses that points us in the direction as to why we should embrace this process and engage in it. For example, the principle of John chapter 17, 14 verse 19, being in this world but not of this world. You know, so we're not of this world, but we are in this world, and being in this world requires that we often have to render to Caesar that which is Caesar's and to God that which is God as well as a number of other principles from other scriptures, including scriptures like Colossians chapter 3, verse 23 to 24. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human accreditation masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord, a true certificate that's embossed with all those beautiful descriptions in the book of Revelation, from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. And let me say to you, it is verses like that that has helped me to keep perspective. When I've had to wade through that tons and tons of paperwork and related legislation and requirements. Or even um, 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 2, um, and I know what the context of the passage is, it's talking about a true apostle. Um, now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. So, so I think those are just some of the verses that, that could help us, you know, and especially if you need to convince your boards or your constituencies as to why this might be, might be a requirement. Okay, now trying to get into some of the nitty-gritty of what accreditation, maybe not so much is all about, but what some of the issues are that we need to be aware of. There's this troubling quote that I've often heard, in fact, I'm, I think it might have been mentioned here already, but I'm not sure. In Africa, Christianity is, a, is like a lake that is a mile wide but an inch deep. I don't actually know who originally said that. I even tried Google Scholar. <laughs> but but I, I don't really know. Maybe if you, if you do know, you can tell me. However, if that is true, because let me say to you, there's part of that quote that while it is true, part of it is not so true. 
And I do believe there has been development and there has been growth, um, especially in African Christianity. And, and I'm not sure to what degree this has now become a stereotype and become maybe a self-fulfilling prophecy. And so the question is, how are we going to counter that? What is the antidote to that? Um, I believe that given the group that's meeting here today, an effective antidote, it's not the only antidote, because I always believe that seminaries, especially us as Baptist seminaries, we do not exist on our own. We, we exist in partnership with the church. We are servants of the church. We are not above the church. We serve the church. But we have got a very specific role to play. And so, in order to provide an antidote to that, so that that could change, I believe that a solid theological education and education institutions is going to be very, very important. And, and while it is possible to accomplish that, because it has been accomplished even before the notion of accreditation, we are living within a different environment today in which there is a need for solid theological education and theological education institutions. Let me just quickly share one more personal testament in this regard. In the early days of accreditation, we got together some of the local theological schools. We were the only Baptist school in the area, but there were other evangelical theological education institutions that were all feeling the pressure. So we got together and we formed a group that I was part of, and we also called it ACTS. But for us, ACTS meant the Association of Christian Theological Schools. And that association was formed in order to help one another through this quagmire of what accreditation had become. But we also realized that what our government was doing was they were responding to the plethora of institutions that were claiming to offer certain theological degrees in our country, but also outside of our country, that people via the internet were accessing. So, for example, the vice chairman of this group, because at that time I was serving as the chairman, used this as an example and said, do you know what I was able to do this past month? I got my dog ordained. <laughs> because he wanted to try, you know, he, he responded to one of these emails that said, we can offer you the following qualification. And so he did that, and he put in his dog's details, and he received the certificate, Reverend Fluffy. Yeah. And then he said to us, and now I'm trying to get him a doctorate. <laughs> now, I'm not too sure whether he accomplished that, but, 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 but that was the kind of environment in which, we were, in which we were working in. And so having a solid theological education system is is in the current environment in which we are in, probably best achieved through accreditation. How is this achieved? Well, basically, there are four ways in which one can achieve accreditation or some form of accreditation or certification. The one is through national or international accreditation agencies. Now, I will say to you later on, it's very important for you to be aware what is happening in your country or maybe even what is happening within your region. Um, because... More often than not, your government will stipulate what is allowed or what is not allowed um, and what the requirements are if you are required to, to go through some kind of accreditation. Uh, in most instances, it's national accreditation. That's what happens within your country. In some cases, one can apply for international accreditation. But I've also discovered that that's often where the danger lies because I've been presented in the different roles that I play, not just at the, se at the seminary, having to assess um, together with the academic dean when students apply and they claim to have certain qualifications that we are not familiar with, um, or potential faculty members that sometimes um, contacts us and claim to, to have certain qualifications, um, where the, the, the name that, that is often on their certificate or the words that's on their certificate is an international accreditation, which sounds good, but sometimes it's actually meaningless. So, so one just needs to be aware and you need to be careful about what is, um, what is permissible within, within your situation. The other way in which this can be achieved, and, and this was one of the ways in which we used to achieve this as a seminary, is through a cooperative agreement 
with a local or international university or a similar institution. So, for example, our seminary, for a period of just more than 25 years, 25 going on to 26 years, had a cooperative agreement with one of our universities in the country, the University of Pretoria, that allowed us to offer degrees because previous legislation prevented us from offering a degree. We could develop a curriculum for a program that is as good as any degree, but we couldn't use the word degree on that qualification because we, we were prevented from legislation in our country. So the only way we could do that, which was permissible then within the, in our situation, was to enter into an agreement, and, and, and we, uh, a co cooperative agreement. And what we did was we investigated a number of places in England, in the United States, eventually we settled on the possibility of South Africa and had a cooperative agreement with the University of Pretoria that allowed us to offer, first of all, their bachelors until we were able to accredit our own bachelors. Um, we have a transitional degree between a three-year bachelors and a master's called an honors degree, then a master's degree in which we had variations of that master's as well as a PhD. And so that was allowable and that was permissible. But then all of a sudden, the accreditation requirements changed. And we had all of those programs very recently axed from us. You know, so it's been a difficult exercise because our legislation now states you cannot do that, it is illegal to do that. Which makes it difficult for us, you know, and I want to acknowledge the wonderful presentation from Southeastern Seminary yesterday through the Global Theological Initiative. Um, that is an endeavor that we as a seminary in South Africa would not actually be able to embrace because our legislation prevents that. Unless Southeastern Seminary were to go through the accreditation process in South Africa and vice versa, we would have to negotiate with them, with their accrediting agencies, even though it's a distance learning program, in order to be able to offer that. So, so our situation in South Africa has become very, very restrictive, but, but that's one of the ways in which it still can happen for many of you. And I know that some of you have spoken to me about some kind of cooperative agreement, but as you can hear, you know, we, we, we face quite a difficult situation at the moment. Another way in which people have attempted to do this, not strictly speaking accreditation, but is, is, is seeking for endorsements from credential verification agencies. So sometimes when students um, have to go and study in Europe or in America, um, they have to have their qualification verified through some kind of verification agency. I know at one stage I attempted to do that, um, and so I know what that process is all about. But sometimes some of these credential verification agencies will allow an institution for whom they have provided the service for a number of years to almost tacitly give you almost a kind of accreditation in which they will say, any student who comes through um, that process, they, were willing, they, they are willing to endorse. Not many of them are willing to do that. Um, I know of a seminary in South Africa that's negotiating with such an agency in Europe at the moment, but they are accredited in South Africa. And then there's the issue of self-accreditation. Um, now, I, I need to put a caveat here, you know, and to say that self-accreditation is not necessarily wrong or it is not necessarily questionable. But there are many instances in which this has become questionable. Um, so, so I'm aware of certain situations, you know, and yeah, I want to mention my brothers from Nigeria, you know, because their situation is different to ours. I mean, they've got very good Baptist institutions, and they have worked on a process like this, in which they are self-accrediting each other, but according to well-established standards. So that is good. Our experience is that with many students who sometimes apply to us from other places, claim to have accredited qualifications, but they are actually self-accredited qualifications, which sometimes are incredible because institution A and institution B has entered into agreement in which they say, um, you will evalu evaluate on our, on our behalf, your qualification will do the same for you, and we will in between create this body which is sometimes a virtual body, not a real body, um, that will have international accreditation and all those kinds of things added to that. So sometimes it, it creates a situation in which one has to have this kind of oxymoron, you know, credible ac accreditation, you know, it's like the honest truth, you know, truth always should be honest. 
Accreditation should always be accreditation, you know, but because of what people is doing, how credible is it? Now, I believe that we, we don't do theological education in a vacuum, and so we need to be aware of efforts that are in place, especially within the broad evangelical world, that has provided motivations, and in some ways, sometimes assistance in helping us to achieve um, accreditation within the broad evangelical world. And one of the, this is the initiatives of ISET. You know, some of you, I know many of you here, are familiar with ISET. There's some of the materials out there. But the International Council for Evangelical Theological Education has taken the issue of accreditation very seriously and sometimes has had consultations with it in different regions, etc., etc. But at the end of the day, their goal is about trying to build quality into education. And in most cases within the modern world, quality in education, building quality into education means, some, means that you need some kind of accreditation process. So there are some motivations from ICET that I just want to mention if you're not familiar with them. In 1981, they pro pro produced a manifesto on the renewal of, of evangelical theological education, which, <coughs> while it doesn't speak directly to the issue of accreditation, I believe just helps to lay a much stronger foundation for it. Then in 2017, they had their own declaration that seeks to develop a common global framework for accreditation of evangelical theological education, including global indicators of quality assurance. You need to be aware that's the buzzword. In South Africa, when you talk about accreditation, it's about quality assurance. What are all the issues? What are all the aspects that will guarantee that you are offering a good, solid theological education? Quality assurance and comparability of regional degree specifications. Because that's what I've discovered that what is called Bachelor of Theology in one part of the world means something very different in another part of the world. And so there one needs to talk about parity and sometimes what is called portability, especially if students are wanting to transfer from one student to, to another. So, so that is ICIT. And the way in which ICIT has sought to accomplish this is through ACTI. I know many of you know ACTI, formerly called the Accrediting Council for Theological Education in Africa. <coughs> but because... The goalposts have been shifting, and even currently is still shifting. ACTI has experienced, like many of the um, sub-bodies under ACTI, um, some of them were mentioned earlier, um, the focus has shifted in many parts of the world away from, from accreditation, especially as institutions in those parts of the world have had national agencies coming into place. And, and that's the situation, for example, that has affected ACTI even here in Kenya. Um, but now they are called the Association for Christian Theological Education in Africa, in which a large part of what they still do is accreditation. Um, and so their mission is to strengthen member institutions in offering quality theological programs through accreditation, networking, and support services. Now, when we talk about accreditation, one of the key things is often, what do you need to do in order to become accredited? And, and, and the key terminology we talk about here is standards. And so every, every accreditation agency that I know of or that I've ever encountered has got some kind of standards. And many of these standards are actually quite similar. They might frame it differently. They might group it differently. Um, they might add a few extra things, like, like what happens in South Africa. But basically, they will cover a number of areas. Now, ACTI, for example, um, follows standards in five key areas of administration, teaching staff, facilities, educational programs, and students. So I'm not going to be going through the details of that. You can get that off their website. And let me say to you that, that, that even if you are not ready for it now, there is no harm in beginning already to familiarize yourself with some of those standards, some of those processes. You know, because ACTI has had quite a lot of experience in this regard, um, and they work off the process of best practice. What have we seen is good in one institution, um, that is possible to be done in another institution, and in that way you build best practice. You know, and, and as an accreditation um, agency, um, in doing that work, they are very helpful. You know, they are not like Frankenstein's monster. Um, but then there's also, which I want to make mention of, the Cape Town Commitment. Somebody has made mention of this already. The Third Luzon Congress on World Evangelization. Where part of the Cape Town Manifesto was to present a challenge to theological education. 
for theological education to see them as being part of the mission of the church, helping the church to fulfill its mission. And I believe that if we're going to be doing that, given the factors that we are facing today, accredited theological education is coming more and more important. So I'm not going to be reading through all of that, but just to say they have laid down a challenge, and, I, and I'm hoping that that would be able to provide further motivation, motivation as well. Um, another helpful resource that I have used um, for a number of years is this very, very helpful book, even though it's not dealing per se with accreditation, but when you take a look at what Steve Hardy has sought to accomplish in this book, um, that's, the, that's the ISET version when Steve Hardy or originally published it. It looked like this. A book called Excellence in Theological Education, Effective Training for Church Leaders. He basically, based on his experience, having worked with many institutions in Africa, evaluated and helped to help them to get to improve their, 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 their standards so that we are able to live up to the charge that has been placed before us, um, this deposit that, is, um, that has been given to us. And so there are many practical things that Steve Hardy covers that being familiar with accreditation standards, I want to say he actually touches on the vast majority of them. And it is a very easy read, a very helpful guide that I would say would help you to be able to to accomplish that. You know, I, I just took a little extract there um, in, in, his, in his opening chapter where he talks about who determines standards of excellence. And he starts with God as well. And then he says, but then we, we don't only have responsibilities to God, we have responsibility towards our constituent community, our churches, but also then government and approval agencies, etc. Right, so what then are the benefits of accreditation? I just want to give a few. As we, as we draw to a close. Um, I think it gives us opportunities for accountability. Because let me say to you, we mustn't just view accreditation as that period when we are going through the pain of having to produce and deliver the paperwork. But you see, any good process that works towards accreditation should be an ongoing process in which you do reflection, you do self-evaluation, etc. Now, we are forced in the South African situation to do that. Um, they don't just say to us, well, you were accredited five years ago, now you're being accredited again, you produced good documentation then. They actually force us to say, do it from scratch. And so, <laughs> it's almost impossible to do it from scratch when you are given the timeline. So it is something that you have to be doing in the in-between period. And in doing that, you are setting up processes of accountability in many different areas. So I, I, I think that, 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 is a, um, that that's a great benefit. I think it builds credibility for your institution and your programs. You know, it has is, it is, it is always done, a, done our hearts good. You know, when out of the blue from, you know, you know, never know where sometimes, people contact you and they begin to talk to you about what they've heard of you, your good reputation. You know, and, and that comes about... Um, through the grace of the Lord, but also sometimes because we have been able to maintain um, um, accreditation. I think it provides a map for quality assurance. You know, one, one cannot just import the quality assurance process from another institution directly into yours, because your situation might be completely different. But it helps you to build that map um, and to find shortcuts sometimes, um, not, not illegal shortcuts, no legal shortcuts, you know, through, through, through some of these processes. And as you build that experience, you find the process of quality assurance actually becomes part of your DNA. And, and, and that must be our goal. It provides opportunities for re revision and renewal. That sometimes, you know, we, we have assumed that the curriculum that we have, which was put together um, just after the resurrection of Jesus, and that that's the curriculum, that is the curriculum, that we are going to be able to teach until he comes again, whenever that is going to be. You know, but, but we need to remember that, that circumstances change, times change, um, development takes place, you know, and so it gives us opportunity to revise and to renew. It gives us credibility with our students. Now, that's what our accreditation agency tells us. You have got consumers, they are your students. You need to guarantee that when they leave your institution, they've got some credible paperwork that they're taking with them. And then I think also it builds reputation. 
and helps with portability of qualifications, which means that when your students do apply to go to another institution, and that, for example, is what happens in our situation in South Africa, I can tell you the whole history of how many of our students in the past, having spent four years with us, go to university, and the university tells them the qualification is not worth the paper it's written on, even though we believe it is. But now, because we are accredited, the university has to recognize us. And it's also made it easier for our students who wish to go and study at, at institutions overseas. So now I just quickly want to share some practical consider considerations, some shared solutions. You know, given who we are gathered here today, and even though it has been said, and I agree, that it's probably going to be difficult for this kind of network to grant or to provide some form of accreditation for Baptists across the continent. I still believe, however, there are some opportunities that we need to pursue that could help, in which we could help one another. And so let me share some of that. Um, first of all, we need to be aware of legislation and requirements and developments within your own country. You first of all need to make sure what is required back home at the ranch, where you are from. Because different governments will have different um, requirements. But once you have established that, I think we need to seek and develop and establish best practice in all aspects of seminary life. So in other words, here's an opportunity when we gather together like this to talk about these issues. How does the issue of governance work in the seminary I'm part of? How does the issue of governance work in your seminary? Let's talk to each other about it. What are some of the problems we have experienced? What are some of the dangers? What is accreditation requirements in your country like? What is accreditation requirements in our country? In that way, we are actually involved in cross-pollination. You know, we, we are helping each other. We are broadening our own horizons. And this could be areas in areas like finance, administration, faculty, curriculum, policies. And let me say to you, our system in South Africa is policy heavy. They are like policy crazy, you know. You have to have a policy for everything, you know. And sometimes you sit and you, and, uh, and I remember that, you know, so, I'm sitting in front of my computer with a blank um, screen, you know, not a blank screen, a blank word document. I have to draw up a policy for student health. Okay. <laughs> but it would be nice if somebody else had developed a policy that I could maybe chat about um, and we could talk about and instead of me reinventing the wheel, you know. And so, and so, that is what a forum like this, I believe, could, pre could provide us opportunities. Um, and all of that relates to accreditation. And then I think the opportunity for networking. You know, it will be possible in some of your situations to transfer your accreditation to other institutions in other countries. We in South Africa, unfortunately, we cannot do that. Um, but where those opportunities exist, why not actually do that? So that brings to the end my part of the presentation. So.